Hi, welcome to the start of the journey into space, a journey that always begins with a rocket launch. The first thing we're going to do is take a look at how rocket propulsion works. A key question is, how big does the rocket have to be to get us into space? A more direct way of posing this question is, how much rocket fuel, or propellant, do we need to accelerate the rocket to a sufficient velocity? But before we can tackle the question of how much propellant we need, we have to understand what velocity is sufficient to put a spacecraft into orbit. So we're going to take a look at that first. Imagine for a moment that we've been given the task of throwing a ball-sized spacecraft into space. In general, someone is going to pay us to get this ball into space. So we're going to call it a payload, of course. Since we're throwing it, all we can do is give it an initial vertical velocity at ground level. Given this velocity, how high is the ball going to go? In other words, what altitude will it achieve? We're going to make a very basic estimate of the initial speed using the principle of conservation of energy. The velocity we give the ball at ground level, the kinetic energy, will be converted into potential energy as the payload gains altitude. At ground level, we define the altitude, or height h, and therefore the potential energy to be zero. So the total initial energy is 1 half mv squared. When the payload achieves maximum height, it'll have zero velocity, and its potential energy at that point will be mgh. Now we solve for h to get an expression which tells us the altitude achieved for any initial vertical velocity. Now I'm sure you're very strong, so imagine you throw this ball upwards with an initial speed of 1.4 kilometers per second. Given that the gravitational acceleration is 9.8 meters per second squared, we apply the formula and discover that the ball achieves a height of 100 kilometers. Now, that's not too bad, as that's where the atmosphere ends and space begins. We generally talk about being in space at about 130 kilometers. Beyond that point, the atmosphere is thin enough that we can sustain an orbit for a reasonable period of time. Keep in mind that this is a very rough estimate. We've ignored a number of effects, including air resistance and the change of gravity with altitude, for example. So let's aim a bit higher. We'll use the conservation of energy again, but this time we're going to figure out what velocity we need to achieve a given altitude. This time we solve for V. Now we want to aim for a good healthy altitude at which sustaining an orbit is a reasonable proposition, say, 300 kilometers. We'll take a value for g again of 9.8 meters per second squared. Plugging these values into the equation gives us a velocity of 2.4 kilometers per second. Now, it's important to re-emphasize that this is also a very rough estimate. Once again, we've neglected air resistance, the change of the gravitational force with altitude, and so forth. So now we've got our ball-sized satellite at an altitude of 300 kilometers, and it's got zero velocity. That's fine for some applications. We could take a few photographs or make some other measurements, but pretty soon our payload is going to fall back towards Earth. So with a velocity of 2.4 kilometers per second, we've created a ballistic trajectory, not an orbit. If this kind of speed is not enough to keep our payload in orbit, how much speed do we need? The diagram here is not at all to scale. We want to achieve a repeating trajectory, an orbit. Let's aim for a circular orbit for our satellite, which has a mass of m, and it will have a circular velocity of v. To figure this out, we have to elicit the help of Sir Isaac Newton. Newton's second law states that the sum of the forces on an object is equal to its mass times its acceleration. This is normally a vector equation, but we're going to only analyze it in the radial direction. So we can suffice with the scalar equation shown here. That's okay for now, because the only force we're going to consider is the gravitational force. And in this simple model, that force is along the radius in the negative direction. 
Indeed, we're going to simplify things even further, for now, and assume the gravitational force is just mg. Now we apply Newton's equation by filling in the only force, mg, on the left-hand side of the equation. On the right-hand side, we replace the acceleration a with v squared over r, which is the radial acceleration for an object moving on a circular path. Now be careful here. r is the length of the radius from the center of mass of the Earth to the center of mass of our satellite. It is not the altitude. So r is the Earth's radius plus the altitude h. Before we apply this equation, keep in mind that this is a very rough estimate again. We've neglected a host of other forces and effects, and we'll discuss how to deal with those later. Nevertheless, this will give us a decent first approximation of the velocity that we need. So the velocity for a circular orbit can be estimated by applying f is equal to ma. And we'll keep in mind that r is the length of the radius to the satellite, not the altitude. We divide both sides of the equation by the mass m and solve for v. Now we've got what we need to make a rough first approximation of the velocity required to maintain a circular orbit at a particular altitude. So let's consider an altitude of 300 kilometers again, which is equivalent to a radius of about 6,700 kilometers. Using 9.8 meters per second squared for g, we find that we need a velocity of 8.1 kilometers per second to stay in a circular orbit. That's quite a bit more than the 2.4 kilometers per second that we needed merely to reach this altitude. Fine. So do we need to launch our satellite at this speed? Well, not quite. On the one hand, it's important to note that we need a far greater velocity to maintain a circular orbit at this altitude than we did just to reach it. On the other hand, we get a little help from the Earth. This is because our spot on the ground, our launch site, is moving due to the Earth's rotation. If we assume our launch site is at the equator, then the ground, and our satellite with it, is already moving at almost half a kilometer per second. That means we only have to add about 7.6 kilometers per second to achieve the required velocity for a circular orbit at 300 kilometers altitude. This required change in velocity is called the delta v. Once again, this delta v is a first rough approximation. The actual delta v required will be higher. We have to overcome a number of forces, such as air resistance and gravity, among other things. Now that we have a feel for the velocity required to maintain a circular orbit, we need a rocket to accelerate our payload. The next step is to take a look at how rockets work.